Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 404, Frequently Asked Questions That Men Have About Testosterone Replacement. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. We're going to begin our conversation this week by talking about an issue that men begin to experience usually in their 50s, sometimes earlier, depending on their stress levels and some other factors, and that's what we'll talk about. Uh, called erectile dysfunction, ED. And when men of that age group start to experience erectile dysfunction, they can't get an erection when they want one, or they get one that they don't feel is satisfactory. Or it doesn't uh, last long enough. Doesn't last somebody, long enough. Somebody isn't said firm enough. Yesterday, you, it didn't last an hour, so I think I... I <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, yeah. let's see what we can... That's not Do you ever just go, typical. TMI, TMI? No, no, I mean, I, no. no, that's fine. As a doctor, fine. you can't, right. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, it, but to me, that meant, okay, so we're going to have to do something more than is hu- is usually human. Right. To This is what not just going to be testosterone. This is going to be testosterone plus Viagra or for, plus something else. The question that I always got in counseling, especially marriage counseling, was what's average? What's normal? It doesn't matter what's average. It's what who you are that and what you aunt, expect. That- you must have had some counseling. I, no, I've looked, yeah, I have, actually. But. <laughs> At any rate, we want to talk about erectile dysfunction because there's a lot of stuff that's new and unfolding about both erection and our understanding about it. Uh, ED is a precursor. It's a warning sign mm-hmm. that five years down the road, you are more likely to have strokes and heart attacks. It's not just a sexual functionality issue. It's a blood flow issue. And, mm-hmm. and we want people to become aware of it, and we want doctors to make people aware of it and to remember you need to monitor your blood pressure because it'll heart. kill you if you don't. Yeah, and your heart. If you get When you get ED, there's several things you have to think about. Right. One is, uh, am I getting atherosclerosis? Um, am I getting diabetes? Am I getting heart disease? You know, hardening of the arteries keeps your blood vessels from dilating. So... So these are the other medical things that can cause ED. The other thing is hormonal. Is my testosterone dropping? Right. So we all prefer to think, oh, I'm just getting old. Is my testosterone dropping? Mm -hmm. My libido is going down. I don't want as Mm -hmm. much as I used to want. But it can be other things. There's there's a whole bunch of medicines that men as they age get put on for other factors that can result in ED. And, so can and we there are talk all, about what yeah, some of those medicines some of the, are? And that's really what no one talks about. Right. Is that there are certain medications for blood pressure or heart disease or, you know, the very things that we're worried about mm-hmm. causing uh, ED or being a sign that you're getting this uh, being when you get ED. You know, well, like it's a they've... warning sign. But we also, sorry, we also... Um, have to look at the medicines we give for those very exactly, same things. for those things, like diuretics. Right. A lot of men, as they age, they start to put on a little weight. They start to slow down. Their they, musculature is not as strong as it they was. They get high blood pressure, and so the first thing they get put on is, usually is a diuretic to get rid of salt and water. Yes. And so that drops your blood pressure. And they'll tell you, quit eating salt and maybe slow down your caffeine intake. But mm-hmm. in the meantime, let's put you on this diuretic, and, and that'll help you uh, pee it out more. Right. And so what happens is... Then you don't have enough blood volume to actually have an erection. So when you pee out water, you're actually decreasing your blood volume, which is how it works to decrease your blood pressure. But then your blood volume may be too low to actually get an erection. So my answer to that is if you have to be on a diuretic, like if you had heart failure and you'd have to be on it or for some other reason it's necessary... Then like you, a beta blocker. Uh, yeah, well, that's not a diuretic. No, so we'll talk. But, we'll so talk about. Yeah, we'll again. talk about those. But, okay. But this is if you if you are on these, you have to take them the opposite part of uh, the opposite side of the day that you're going to have sex, or you're going to have to change when you have sex. Because if you take your diuretic 
right, you know, within an hour of your, of, of deciding to have sex, then your blood pressure is going to go down. Your volume, your blood volume is going to go down. You may not be able to, to have an erection because of that, because you need to have normal blood volume. So that's one thing you have to look at. Then another thing is another blood pressure issue. Um, the medicines that they use for blood pressure, one's a beta blocker. That's what you were talking about. Right. We use it for heart and we use it for blood pressure and, and we use it for tech, like an arrhythmia. So metaprolol and, um, all the all OLs after mm -hmm. not, you know, it sounds almost like a cholesterol, but, um, they, anything that is a beta blocker and that, that's the type of medication can cause this problem. So amphetamines? Nope. That's opposite. That's okay. an opposite drug. So. Beta blockers for blood pressure. Amphetamines we take we give to a lot of people for ADD mm -hmm. and weight loss, and uh, also for as you age, if you're not thinking very well, you can get an amphetamine for that. That's one of the diagnoses that they use them for. Sleep apnea, or not sleep apnea, excuse me, but um, narcolepsy. So that's um, the amphetamines actually vasoconstrict all your blood vessels. So. If you're vasoconstricted, you can't dilate. So I guess the summary should be that you don't need to know this, but you need to know that your doctor is considering it. And but so you need to ask the question. You should ask your doctor you put specifically. put me on any of these things or let them know I'm on these things and I'm beginning to have ED issues. Because mm -hmm. they may not ask you that. They, they think, and, and rightly so, they think They're I'm treating saving. treating symptom to triage. I mean, your heart's not going to crack, so mm -hmm. we're okay. And you come back a couple months later and say, yeah, but I, I can't get it up anymore. And they kind of go, ah, eh, yeah. like that's not important. Yeah. It would be important if, if they couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, but but they don't view that as, oh, well, that's not life-threatening problem. So I'm going right. to, but there are different drugs you can take that are better for you so that you don't get ED right. from your drugs. So you have to ask them, what's the best drug I can take? So that I am not going to have ED from the medicines that save that are saving my life, right? Because you shouldn't have to take Viagra because it's counteracting a drug that you take. Well, and that's the thing: you don't want to be a chemistry set experiment. If, if you and your doctor are both conversing about mm -hmm. these things, and you make your doctor aware of your your realities or your concerns, mm -hmm. then the doctor will factor that into their decision making. And you you can time your medications during the day to be. After you've had sex, mm -hmm. if, the, if if that's possible, if you can plan sex, um, it's not very if you spontaneous. Plan it spontaneously, yeah, yeah. So it's not very spontaneous, but you could. So the two drugs for blood pressure mm -hmm. that would be ideal if you if they work for you would be Benacar and uh, Cardiazem. Those two drugs are really not the cause of ED. So if you if you have a choice for blood pressure medicine, those two would be. What you would want to choose in case your doctor doesn't know. Benicar and what was the other? And Cardiazem. Cardiazem. Z E M. Yeah. So those are two that are good. Now we've had people go uh, on ADD medicine mm -hmm. and call us and say my testosterone's not working because they're taking the ADD medicine and then they want to have and you sex. Say, Slow down. Well, Slow well, down. well, wait. A <laughs> <laughs> and and so I have to say what what new medicines are you on and yeah. did something else happen? And, you know, we go through all of those questions and then they say, yeah, I'm on ADD medicine. And so now I can think, and now I have enough energy to get through my day, but I can't have sex. <laughs> so for those, now I can think just not about having if, sex. Yeah. If you're yeah. taking it in the morning, yeah. then you're not going to be having sex that morning. You should have it later that night. You shouldn't take it right before you want to have sex. It's not helpful. Right. <laughs> it, and some people don't get affected this way, so I'm not saying that this is everybody, but there are enough that I've heard it over and over again. Okay. So so the timing can be changed or the drug can be changed. So I guess the main point there, we covered a lot of ground, talked about a lot of different things, but the main point is that if you're starting to have issues as a man with erections, it is significant. Don't ignore it. And talk to your daughter, uh, your daughter, doctor, not your doctor, daughter. Talk to your doctor. So be horrified. About <laughs> <laughs> See, you don't have a daughter. The complete, so that's <laughs> a complete range of issues that are involved. And probably part of the conversation that you will then have with your physician is about your prostate and prostate exams. Mm -hmm. 
So what is considered to be normal as a man ages for prostate concerns? Uh, well, in general, uh, it's not normal, but it is common for testosterone to drop. And as it drops, the prostate usually enlarges. So it's okay. not what you think is logical, that testosterone makes your prostate large. It, it doesn't. Low testosterone makes your prostate large. So so that's a common misconception even among physicians. I was going to say, I've had doctors tell me the exact opposite of that, but it was years ago. It was years ago, and hopefully they've learned something yeah. since then. But the prostate usually does enlarge, and what that means is as we get older, and if we don't take testosterone, that means you have to go to the bathroom all the time. You have frequency and urgency, and it's, it's a real life problem because you may not be near a bathroom if you're traveling or even if you're in your car. So, so it may not be just the concern about prostate cancer right. it may that be men cancer. have. It, it has to do with the frequency of urination, their ability to hold it for as long as they need mm -hmm. to, uh, the force of the flow, mm -hmm. uh, all of those may things not be able to empty. are impacted if the prostate, the prostate is enlarged. Right. That's so right. you need to have so, that so evaluated. That should be evaluated if you have that issue. I mean, some some there are medications that we use to actually help your flow. Flowmax is one Flomax of them. Flowmax is one of them. And women and, aren't supposed to touch that one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> At no. least women that are breeding. <laughs> breeding. Okay. So <laughs> are fertile. That too. <laughs> you have so much to learn. Okay. <laughs> oh, I do. I'm glad to be here. So, um, so, so that we want, if you have those problems, we want you to see your primary care or a urologist to get them evaluated. They could mean something else. You could have an infection, a prostatitis. You, you could have um, a mass in the prostate. You have to have that looked at. And now they have decided that prostate exams, digital, uh, digital exams, where the doctor puts his or her finger into your rectum to feel the prostate size, mm -hmm. are not necessary routinely, meaning you have no symptoms, you go see the doctor and they do a prostate exam. So that's off the list now for doctors. But if you have trouble passing urine, they are going to do an exam yeah. to see what's going on and if your prostate is enlarged. So that's good medicine. They should do that. Well, yes. The, the, the issue around that or the question around it seems to be, are those reliable tests? I mean, if a doctor just digitally manipulates you and they come up with a conclusion, well, I think that's a concern. Uh, or they think it's swollen, maybe you have cancer. And it's a false mm -hmm. alarm because you don't have cancer. Uh, they now say that they have 50% false positives on digital exams. It depends on who does them. I mean, well, I would think so. As a that's all part of the I thing. I spent my life doing ovarian exams where. You haven't done a lot of prostate exams? I, no. Telling us? I'm telling you, I haven't. You don't, don't do that? I, I depended on my primary care and my, and my urologist to do that for my male patients. Sure. But, but I spent 30, some more than 30 years doing every day feeling people's ovaries. Right. Now, they say so you develop an expertise. Right. So as I got older, I was able to feel them more. And even if they were small with an abnormal growth on them, I could feel it. You develop techniques where okay. your fingers I'll, I'll are your that. eyes. Yeah. And you get better and better at that. Now, there's some people that can't do anything. They can't feel my, an ovary or a prostate. My question was always, okay, you see me once every year, maybe every year and a I half. I write down how it feels. Okay, that, that was my question. So I write, I write down, well, The doctor would do that and it's say, this well, it's size. Uh, slightly You this can put or your that. fingers around what, you know, I mean, you can put one finger in there and then go like this and feel the circumference. I'm sorry. No, that's no, no. That's what we I, do. I believe you. I know you, you're horrified. That, that, no, I'm not. I'm not. My, my question was, how in the heck do you associate that with me a year later? We write it down. Okay, well that's and we that, say if it's nodular or if there were if that's it was irregular I had, and, it, and it's soft, it's hard. You write all that down. Okay, so if it's normal, it's normal. You just write normal because it just feels like every other prostate of every other guy that you've tested. No identified concern, just normal. Right, normal. Okay, so no, it doesn't I, that that makes sense to me and that helps. And I'm so that's cynical why we that, write notes. Uh, but I never asked that question of the physician that was doing it. You know, mm -hmm. how, oh, yeah, how the heck do you know? Or how, how do you not have yeah. me confused with my cousin who was in here last week? And That's and how. Similar. It's on paper. Okay. Or it's on a computer. 
but that's how we do it. I mean, right. it is doable, and it should be done. I, I don't dispute that. I just didn't have the information. But just like ovaries, you can't see it. You can't. I mean, yeah. it's really hard. I've never thought to about see, that. And, but there are now, um, for ovaries, we use ultrasound. And right. I always said the next step in gynecology will be you don't get a pelvic exam. You get an ultrasound exam. They carry an ultrasound around and look at your ovaries and look at your uterus instead of feeling them. So that's probably the next step, but there's a, and there's an ultrasound for prostates, but it, it still involves a, a rectal exam. All right, I'm going to display my medical ignorance here. Uh, when I went to a urologist to have that checked, they put a tube in my penis and looked through an eye scope. Mm -hmm. Can they see the prostate no. from that? They were looking at your bladder. And the, intru or the compression could, of the you, bladder would be an assumption see. they would make? If they had your, if they filled your bladder, uh, they could, it's possible for them to see the prostate pushing up into the into the bladder. Okay, so they they could see. But that's kind of a. I mean, it's it's it's, it's very, not the way to do it to make that. It's diagnosis hard to make. Well, I'm just saying it's hard to make a diagnosis that way uh -huh. unless your prostate's huge. Okay, and then your symptoms would be so bad. That they would probably just say, we know your prostate So as huge. a man older than 50, what do I need to know or track about PSA numbers, uh, PSA size, potential cancer PSA le treatments? levels. So PSA is a screening test. Okay. It's not the end-all, be-all. If you have a high PSA, it doesn't consider prostate-specific prostate antigen. antigen. It doesn't. It comes from other places in your body. It doesn't necessarily mean... If your PSA is high, you have um, you have prostate cancer. In fact, there's one drug called allopurinol for gout. If you take that, you're always going to have a high PSA. It makes it go up. So, I mean, there's one gentleman that I know who his PSA is 10 all the time because he's on allopurinol, and, and he's a normal. doctor didn't know that would have a heart attack. Right? Be like, oh my god. Right. So the normal, so a normal level of PSA. Mm -hmm is considered four, less than four. Now, that's up to age 55. After age 55, the normal goes up. Bracket creep. It keeps yeah. going up. So right. people who are over 55, the PSA goes up as to normal, but not every doctor really thinks about that or or views that as, as how they look at a prostate. They freak out a lot of people. So, so then again, the concerns may be uh, comfort level or, or process problems with urination, mm -hmm. but it may also be uh, a radar warning of cancer. Yes. So if so, we have to, so we have to look and see. I mean, we have to find out what it is. So they, they do biopsies. So the next step, if they feel like prostate's enlarged, you have a high PSA, mm -hmm. and you're under fifty-five. Then the next step is biopsy. Okay. Now, what they've come out recently with is that sometimes they feel as you get older, the treatment for prostate cancer may be at, as bad as the prostate cancer itself. Because side effect issues because from the treatment. Because of side effects, the side effects for prostate cancer surgery, not the biopsy, but surgery itself to remove part of the prostate or all of the prostate or lymph nodes and the prostate can be... Inability to have an erection ever because of the damage to the nerves and the blood vessels. That's a big deal. It, it, and It would be to most but men, yeah. There's even worse things that can happen. Yes. You can become incontinent where you have you you are like a baby. You have to wear diapers. You can't hold urine. Uh, urine or feces. You or can be either and or both. And you can become incontinent of the, of the rectum, too, and you can right. lose bowel movements. Yeah. I mean, that changes your life. Hmm. And that is not something that you would want to have happen to somebody unless they were definitely going to die of whatever you're treating them for. I mean, it is still better to be alive, even with these side effects, but... <laughs> you want to know on the front end that that's the risk you're taking. Right. So you want to know that decision. it's so bad that you might die if you don't have this surgery, and it's not always that and if you severe. Do have, and, and they always make you sign a document, usually... usually the night before the surgery, you know, that yeah. you recognize you could die from this. Uh, from the surgery itself, but I've never seen that happen yeah. from the surgery itself. 
It's it's basically no, but, but dying they, of the cancer or dying of uh, or, or wishing you were dying yeah. if with the side effects. So when men are considering testosterone replacement, one of the factors in that can be that they are having ED problems, which we've discussed mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. One of the factors uh, the ED can uh, impact the libido. Another factor around that discussion is the discussion about PSA antigens and the prostate mm -hmm. it, itself. Well, and the reason is, even though testosterone replacement can prevent prostate cancer by, by keeping the prostate small and keeping it healthy, after you have prostate cancer, there and if it is not treated by removal or radiation, then the cells change and they could be fed by testosterone. So if you had a prostate that was not treated, not completely treated, or mm -hmm. they didn't know if they got it all, you would not want to take testosterone. Now, there is a new thought that, especially in the East Coast, that if they've taken it all out, that it is healthier to take testosterone than to not take testosterone because it helps the um, immune system fight cancer. So testosterone is really a cancer fighter. Fighter. It's actually a treatment. But if there is any testosterone, excuse me, uh, testosterone sensitive cancer left, we don't want to feed it. Right. So I make sure that my patients who have had prostate cancer get an approval or a clearance a from, from their from, them. from yeah. their surgeon or their oncologist. Right. And that's hard to get. Yeah. Because they still don't feel real comfortable with testosterone, but they don't want to do anything to, to increase the risk that cancer might come back. Right, because their grow. concern is cancer. Their yeah. concern is not E D. Yeah. And it is not Continents and and I mean their yeah. concern is saving your life, and and my concern is that as well. But you also have to have quality of life, mm -hmm. and if it isn't going to, if you have everything out, you may be better off with testosterone. So so these are conversations or discussions that a lot of men have when when sitting around thinking about these issues. And when they about, come to see me, and, and when, when they, they come me. to see you, and so that as a result, they're frequently asked questions that we. Encounter. I, I have one more thing. All right. If you're getting a PSA test, you cannot have sex. You cannot exercise for 36 hours before the test. You can't have a prostate exam before the test. You know, you have to have a three-day window before you get that drawn or you'll have a false positive and they'll start going down the road of thinking you have prostate cancer. You're talking about the PSA blood PSA test. PSA blood test. Yes. So if, if, if my doctor says... Oh, go to the lab and get your PSA blood level mm -hmm. drawn, and we'll find out. Well, I, 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 I need that... to not have had sex for three days, mm -hmm. ridden a bicycle, exercised. motorcycle, exercised, uh, done anything, and not had a prostate exam because sometimes right. they'll do a digital and then they send you to the lab. Send you to the lab, and then yeah. so you're going to have a positive test. So be aware test. of that. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted you to be aware of that because... That's the one thing I see a lot of high PSAs, yeah. and then I, I give then them the directions. The question, well, did, you, did you do anything? And then oh, yeah. they, they say, yeah, yeah I just did. this morning. And then some of them go, I'm never going to have a PSA again because I'm not going to go without <laughs> sex for three days. I didn't know a fasting blood level meant I couldn't have sex. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's not really specific. But it's, we I just want you to be aware of that before mm -hmm. you get scared by some blood test that's not even right. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.